Continuing on in our analysis of Herbert Schlossberg's book, Idols for Destruction, we move into our third chapter entitled Idols of Mammon. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus unveils to us the dichotomy of two forms of worship that are completely opposed to one another, the worship of Yahweh versus the worship of Mammon. And what he states is startling and perhaps less obvious to the average Christian in practical terms, that we cannot serve one and the other. Rather, we can only serve God or Mammon, not both together. If we elevate our material goods in the pursuit of said material through continuous wealth accumulation, we build a golden calf, a false god, and we replace Yahweh's will and purpose for our lives with our own pursuits and purposes. And what we discover, though, is that what we think to be our own pursuits of gain is truly only serving the purposes of a false god, mammon who allows us to build up our own kingdoms and then consolidates our lives' work into his broader kingdom in opposition to the kingdom of God. In a word, we are servants of a worldly kingdom or a heavenly kingdom, not both. The servitude of an idolatrous kingdom always finds an outlet through the various pathologies that tend to wreak havoc in the lives of those who serve it. Christians live in these idolatrous kingdoms physically, but spiritually we are to serve the heavenly kingdom of God in the midst of that fallen system. The political systems of liberalism versus conservatism try to convince us that their way is the only way, but these systems are simply two wings of the same idolatrous bird that has been formed like the golden eagle of Rome, which stands in opposition to God. There is a better way, but we must break the idol of mammon first before we can get a vision of it. And so there exists within the idolatrous structure of American and even world society at large a framework that the people are forced to think within. As mentioned before, the choice between liberal and conservative mindsets is illustrated through the right and the left wings on the eagle of the nation, Republican versus Democrat, liberal versus conservative. Herein lies the illusion that one of these choices presents a path to personal virtue and societal cleanliness, but the truth of the matter is no one is without dirty hands. The very fabric of American society has now adopted policies that integrate and leverage idolatrous principles based on a dialectical formula of thesis versus antithesis, right versus left, that is transformative and powerful in its deception. And the basis of this transmutation of values and principles is a process known as alchemy. Alchemy is the process of changing one substance into another. Inherently, it is a scientific deception because it is seeking to take a substance of lesser value, like say copper, and transform it into something that is of more value, let's say gold, economically speaking. This is a very deceptive form of theft, though. For if the alchemist is successful in his experiment, then what he has accomplished might perhaps be advantageous to himself in that he now possesses more wealth than he did before his experiment, perceivably. But if his formula becomes widespread practice, the money system becomes flooded with false currency, and this false currency leads to what is known as counterfeit. The basis of counterfeit currency, historically speaking, is the flow of false currency in the overall money supply that's being utilized within daily economic life as if it were real currency. The alchemist's formula in the past has varied in its components, whether it be to shave gold or silver coins and thus destroy the integrity of the rounded coin and decreasing the overall value of the coinage in the system as in the Roman times with Galenius, or during the French Revolution with the printing press and the creation of counterfeit banknotes. For both of these, the effect is the same. Counterfeit currency floods the market. These varied forms of dishonest gain, though, can be summed up in two words, covetousness and theft. The alchemist covets those who have true wealth. 
Those who have gained their living in an honest way are those who are most harmed by the alchemist. Through the process of currency manipulation, the alchemist is able to steal from the honest and thus becomes the violator of the Eighth and Tenth Commandments. Yahweh strictly prohibits this type of dishonest gain in the money system. The Judeans of the past were called out by Isaiah for mixing silver with impurities to make the silver weightier and thus defrauding the people. The prophet Micah calls out the use of dishonest scales, where the scale itself was improperly weighted and thus rigged. Throughout antiquity, nations have sought to overcome this deceit, but the alchemist has always found a way around these laws and regulations. The issue is when these rigged forms of economic activity become state policy. It is a clear indicator that the society has a terminal issue. It was clear that the temple system of Judah in the past, before and even during the time of Christ, was based on alchemical principles that defrauded the people. Hence why Jesus threw out the money changers from the temple courts. The state-sanctioned system of the temple had become corrupted due to the counterfeit money supplies and transactions, or as we might call it, inflationary principles. And so the state of Judah had become the alchemists and as a governing entity reflected in its economic policies and it suffered but who suffered the very people of judah suffered the modern state systems have not only mimicked the ancients in their dishonesty they've rather refined their tactics and made the theft even more efficient Fiat currency, which essentially places the creation of money completely within the hands of the state itself, gives the state unprecedented power to manipulate. It should be noted that fiat simply means let it be done. Therefore, if the state says let it be done, it is thus created. A true and valuable basis and backing of the money supply in reality and is not needed in this case. All that is needed is the full faith of both the issuer and the recipient of the currency to believe in the creator of that wealth when he says, let it be done. And thus, based on the faith of the believer, it exists. Value comes into existence from nothing other than the state's word. This is a form of deceit, though. For no matter how much faith in economic activity springs forth from that fiat currency, in the end, the value of the system itself is only as good as the foundation it is built on. And if the system is built on a ruse, then ultimately any and every gain from that system is simply that, a ruse. The creator of this wealth takes on the characteristic of Yahweh in that he is at least perceived to have the ability to create something out of nothing. However, before Yahweh stated, let there be light, there was not an abyss of nothingness, but rather Yahweh himself, who is the basis of all things. Indeed, everything is held in his hands, and nothing exists or remains in existence outside of him. There is thus a foundation to what we see and know and perceive as being valuable in this realm of existence within which all economic activity occurs. The god of the alchemist, on the other hand, creates a false form of value, where he truly does bring forth something out of nothing. He says, fiat, or let it be done, yet his words are a lie. A lie does create but that which pours forth from this God's mouth is only chaos and destruction. This God's name is Mammon. His mouthpiece in the modern era is the state, which has a varied tool chest of economic forms of manipulation. With the advent of the machines, and specifically the computer, the alchemical formula, which is now composed of ones and zeros, 
can easily be punched into the operating system to produce trillions of dollars in a singular moment. This is the epitome of fiat and has led to the increasing circulation of false currency throughout the system on an exponentially mega scale. The velocity of this money has reached every part of the globe so quickly that in this post-corona world, the foundation of that system built on nothing is beginning to crack. The first sign of this cracking is the rate of inflation. Inflation is simply the amount of counterfeit money flowing within the money supply in comparison to the amount of true money with value backing it up. And now that the overwhelming majority of money in existence today is literally created from nothing, the economies of nations worldwide are due for a dramatic change. But more on that later. Focusing in on the spiritual side of economic life, it should be noted that economic activity composes the majority of a human being's life. Though when pursuit of wealth becomes the primary focus of that life, mammon enters the fray. Mammon means riches or gain. Once again, when man strives for riches, he immediately becomes subjected to envy. Envy acts as the invisible driving force of economic policy in a society that desires wealth instead of God's will. To desire God's will and wealth is to worship both God and mammon, as we said before. But this is an utter impossibility, though, as the Lord Jesus had stated. Consequently, by pursuing wealth while also calling yourself a Christian, you essentially worship mammon under the pseudonym of Yahweh. The United States populace is the perfect example of this type of worship. Democratic republics that act as representatives of an idolatrous, envious people will perpetually reflect the moral life of the people in economic policy. Thus, a society that has a higher interest rate is a society with low moral credit. In other words, if debt equals sin, and a society is run off of debt, then that society is morally run on sin. The presence of this sin, especially that of envy, leads the planners of society to feel the need to curb that sin through economic policies that bring about equality and longevity. This is not for the betterment of all, but rather for the control of all. The outworking of this in our post-Protestant Christian era has found its expression in the destructive Keynesian policy of inflation. That word we have already mentioned, it is the creation of wealth out of nothing, or rather the taking of wealth from those who have and redistributing it to those who do not. Inflation essentially is a wealth tax. It has been said inflation is like a country where nobody speaks the truth. Inflationary principles are based entirely on the reality of false weights and scales condemned by the prophets of old. The Federal Reserve Act was created to make an elastic currency expressing the condemned practice in modern times. In other words, they created a currency of false weights and scales that could fluctuate in value at any given moment. And in an inflationary environment like we are in now, it, may, it, it makes more sense for individual consumers to speculate or gamble rather than invest in gold and silver as even having those precious metals in reserve under the mattress will not buy you bread or water during this time frame, as Schlossberg states. That is why credit accumulation occurs in an inflationary society as you try to get as much value out of the current price as you can before the full crash of the currency occurs. It's a, a race to the bottom in terms of value, but a race to the top in terms of price. Either way, you lose. 
that's the situation we are in on a global scale now, and there's really no way out. Policymakers set the stage for this, but not at the expense of the general uh, public as if they um, were fleecing them. No, it was rather at their gleeful bidding. See, as Sloshberg says, inflation is both cause and effect of moral decline. The citizens like it because they perceive that it gives them something for nothing. It transfers wealth from one and gives to another. Everything perceivably goes up in price. The value of everything seems to follow like homes, cars, etc. And the true moral costs are hidden behind the bureaucratic curtain by the elites and politicians. What the planners of society leverage in these inflationary policies is the easily exploited human vice called envy. It is the desire for someone else's something. And the idea for politicians is that where there is greed, there essentially should be a tax. The greater the desire, the higher the tax. And so in this case, the thought is that it will assuage greed because it costs more to be greedy. But greed is like cancer. It respects no borders or boundaries and demands that which is not its own. And taxing only feeds the desire for more as it loses. Envy, in this case, cares not for its environment, as it will strive for control under any circumstance. In a vision of the future that holds fraternity and equality through taxation, and policy making unknowingly places envy at the foundations of that society. That pseudo equality, which begins economically, always ends in the fraternity of enslavement, not liberty, as de Tocqueville observed. The French Revolution and the Soviet Union are perfect examples of this forced equalitarianism. Envy is always the executioner that leads the way to the guillotine. And changing the environment will not assuage envy. The Tenth Commandment shows us that envy reaches every aspect of life and is therefore a moral issue and not a social condition that can be adjusted or changed to bring about equality from an Enlightenment perspective which focuses on the material world rather than spiritual reality that exists within man. Morals function within the systems that man creates as inputs. The system itself is amoral. If you change it, it does not create moral output based on its structure or functionality alone. It requires spiritual inputs of morality to function on a human plane in order to function at all. To blame the system of economy or function of government is to absolve the citizenry of any form of culpability, as Schlossberg points out. No, the individual, not the system, is to blame. In envy is his vice. It is the disease of materialism that destroys systems of any type of governance. It is the never-ending desire for more, the desire to consume more and more and more, leading to more desires that are equally insatiable. Greed leads to pride, pride leads to envy, and so on and so forth. This is the picture of the giant in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, or the witch in C.S. Lewis' Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, whose food, if consumed, leads to more hunger. Nothing can satisfy envy. It is what Ivan Ilyich called the ethos of non-satiety. And that is why Paul called the love of money the root of all evil. 
But the desire to eternally consume requires resources that provide an unfit, infinite wellspring of provision. (laughs) But alas, our world is full of scarcity. This idea of endless consumption without paying the price, as Schlossberg states, is an illusion. And when people put their faith in an illusion, the illusion takes on a certain sinister reality, as he says. One which often leads to violence, as the desire for endless consumptions leads to the realization that you do not have infinite resources. And therefore, you must take from others when your own provisions run out in order to gratify the green-eyed monster in your spirit. Historically, the most violent instigator of this redistributive system of envy is the government itself. You see, the government takes from those who make just enough to have something taken from them and redistributes that money through various economic mechanisms to those who may not. These redistributive schemes include taxation, trade embargoes, governmental loans, and a litany of policy initiatives and legislations that end up influencing the general public through incentivized programs with political ends in mind. In particular, to sway a vote for any respective political candidate, and typically that candidate is working in conjunction with big business to supply the free lunch to the voters, which in the end will profit big business and big government in the process. Essentially, the government exploits the envy factor within a society, and instead of urging fiscal responsibility in a balanced budget at the individual level, let alone the governmental level, rather manipulates the populace towards their desired goals of profit, and then it consolidates industry. This is found equally within capitalistic societies as it is within socialist ones. Politicians games the voter. They game the voters with the ploy of handouts and free money, seen in the most recent gravy train of stimulus checks in America. And the end goal is the vote itself. Everything moral is cast aside at the expense of the nation's soul. As Edward Tuft of Yale University had stated, a bribe to the voters is, after all, a bribe to the voters. Schlossberg states that in redistributive societies, the law is a thief. Why? Because within a society that has been infected with redistributivist mentality. That society is run on political pressure groups that seek not justice but rather power. They seek the power to decide on behalf of others, which is the who-whom principle that Lenin put forth. Who controls whom? Well, whoever does has the supreme power. And that power does not produce a redistributive government that desires to give to the poor out of charity. No. It rather serves the ends of the political pressure groups that end up taking the place of political parties. And when these pressure groups have ingrained themselves like a parasite so deeply into the system itself, the only way to regain justice is for the entire system to collapse upon itself. It is truly a house of cards. Governments take on the responsibility of individual incomes out of the Enlightenment era's falsity that people can control others out of wisdom and goodness. History has proven the contrary. Though this very idea has become so rooted in the modern conception that our systems of economy and policy are too complex and therefore require external planners to point society into the right direction. And it is exactly here that mammon finds its greatest hold on modern man, through the power of the state. Mammon has found a willing acolyte in the state, which enhances its power 
through bureaucratic domination. The most powerful institution under the federal umbrella is the Federal Reserve, which is ironically a private entity that is not beholden to the federal government whatsoever. They are the chief alchemists, economically speaking, creating wealth out of nothing as an institution. It is mammon incarnate, along with the entire interconnected global central banking institutions. From its tentacles comes the strength of the system of mammon itself to strangulate the citizenry, lift it upside down, and empty its pockets. But not everyone is lifted off of the sacred ground of individual responsibility. Just those who are individually prudent and responsible become the target of the planners and their policies that originate from entities like the Federal Reserve and other governmental policy-making institutions. These policymakers, the bureaucracy, are considered a new class in the overall Western caste system. They do not necessarily live according to law. Rather, they create law upon law, precept upon precept. They are the modern pharisaical class that causes the people to swallow a camel and strain at a gnat. These are the planners who perceive themselves to know better than the masses. There are many reasons as to why they think this. Race, religion, education, class, economic status all play a role. The key is that it is not just economy that these representatives of mammon seek to control, but rather the whole of the life of the citizenry is within their scope of power. Their values trump those whom they have power over. As Ernest Vandenhegg says, central direction makes sense only insofar as its purpose is to thwart the wishes of its citizens. For if the markets produce what people want, quote, trivial sinful things will be produced. Too little education, too much beer, end quote. It is deigned that these bureaucrats would speak in plain language that their desire is to control others in mass. They rather garb their intentions in technical language that confounds the average Joe who is unable to understand the complexity of the present situation as the planners do. Jacques Ellul says that, quote, while planned societies cannot be free, they are nevertheless inevitable because they are the most efficient, end quote. And this is the intent of this new class, create the most efficient society that will reach their desired goals in the quickest way. Now, don't misunderstand the method here, though. The bureaucracy is by no means efficient and is certainly not quick either. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Rather, every new law written, regulation enacted, legislation passed, seeks to solve a previous problem by creating a new problem in the very solution presented. If the state or government actually cleaned up its messes, the new class would cease to exist. As Schlossberg says, a problem solved gives an agency new difficulties justifying its existence. In the economy of the omnicompetent state, nothing succeeds like failure. Schlossberg goes on to give examples of the futility of government controls within an economy, specifically price controls, by citing Diocletian's Edict 301, which sought to restrict the rise in price of certain commodities, even under the penalty of death. Modern controllers institute the same type of restriction in principle, each ignoring the underlying reason for the price increase in the first place, the debasing of the currency. These restrictions ultimately leads to a suffering citizenry who is oppressed by such systems of control. When a society is governed by these types of policies, it's an evidence that the culture has replaced economy with politics, which shifts the focus from production to pool, essentially. Pool as an in influence via power politics. And when production is no longer the foundation to an economy, 
the means of production, which is found in both savings and investments, are no longer seen as a necessity. Keynes understood this even, is the, the importance of savings as it relates to prosperity in saying the morals, the politics, the literature, and the religion of the age joined in a grand conspiracy for the promotion of saving during the 19th century, he says, which ultimately led to the prosperity that followed. Though the planners, like B.F. Skinner, sought to attack individual responsibility and prosperity through the idea of oversaving, generally speaking, this theory states that the more you have, the less someone else has. The more you get individually, the less society has to give to others. Therefore, someone else is starving because you are eating. A simple illustration might help here. You might drive to the local orchard after work and buy a dozen apples to feed your family at home. And there are plenty of apples to go around, and you might say, I got enough for my family to eat. But the planners would say, yes, you did. But the man down the street didn't. He didn't have the same opportunity as you did and couldn't get to the orchard in time and therefore missed out on the apples. You must therefore give him half of your apples. You might say, well, then I can't feed my family. Their response, well, he can't even feed himself. Someone will just have to eat less in your house in order that he might eat a little. You may falter in your words saying, but I worked hard to get the to the orchard. I climbed the apple tree and even paid extra to get to it on time. But save your breath, half of your apples are already gone. Next time you should think of others before you think of yourself. You might even say finally, I I'll share out of my abundance with this man who has little out, out of my own good will. But the planners will respond, you cannot be entrusted with such a responsibility of good will. Give the apples to us first and we will decide if that man even deserves the apples. He might just we might just make apple pie with it, maybe they say, and instead feed ourselves. But that is up to us to decide, not you. Daniel Bell stated that the obtainment of these apples or wealth is a zero-sum game. That's a misapprehension of basic economics, though. It is a correct ascertainment of the policies of redistribution in action, though. It, nobody wins with redistribution. However, basic economics is founded on cooperation, which engages two or more parties in a transaction of mutual beneficence. When the planners intervene in this private process between individuals, any success measured in profit becomes penalized and failure is rewarded. This is a recipe that produces uh, less success and more failure. And the outcome is what we see today, a welfare state that leads to consistent chaos requiring intervention from the government over and over to stave off disaster and complete collapse. The zero-sum game comes into effect only when profit is attacked to the point of decentivizing investors to place their money in valuable assets. And because of inflation and other envy-driven regulatory and tax policies, the capital is consumed rather than invested, which consequently ends up confusing the distinction between income and capital, as Keynes said, the increasing money value of the community's capital goods obscures temporarily a diminution in the real quantity in the stock. Essentially, borrowing against the equity on the house to, to purchase goods is living on the capital versus income. And this translates to the macro city scale in deteriorating roads, building parks, uh, which in principle does the same thing. A society proves it is in dire straits when it resorts to taxing not just income but capital like the ancient Romans did. When a state increases its spending, the result is a reduction in investment from the general populace who end up having less to invest with. The economy becomes like a body living off of its own tissues and sinews and assumes that it's being nourished. And this is not attributed to external factors that are beyond its control, but rather due to its own infantile inability for self-discipline to prepare for its own future.
It is a mentality that refuses to plant a tree that consumes the seed corn, as Schlossberg states. The point of the proverb there is that it warns against killing the goose that laid the golden eggs. And that capital must be preserved in order to provide income. If you enjoy roast goose today, you cannot have golden goose eggs tomorrow. This is why the outcome of greed is always poverty. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that redistribution has made refraining from work more attractive than working itself, since it provides a decent living via stimulus checks. Essentially, goose tastes better than eggs. <laughs> and even though we have the means from a technological perspective for greater advancement in terms of production, we produce less because we've been disincentivized from working harder. Once again, Rome is a perfect example of this principle in action. The first two centuries were prosperous ones, which were floated by opportunities for private initiative across the empire. As the state entered in with the heavy hand of regulation through taxation, poverty and oppression quickly took hold. The, the new class, the, the planners, the bureaucrats, hate entrepreneurs and free thinkers who produce both income and capital for future investments. But why? Because they threaten the planning and blueprints that this elite group has laid out for the rest of the population to follow unquestionably. This group utilizes the term social justice as a cover for legalized theft. And it goes without saying that a state that does not respect man's property will most certainly not respect man's human rights. In other words, his right to life itself. As Schlossberg poignantly says, the state that lays its hand on your purse will lay its hand on your person. In the 1950s, it was thought that this capitalist greed would be assuaged by replacing it with socialism's cooperatives. By 1959, the cost of this cooperation could be measured in some 110 million lives lost. Cooperation inevitably leads to coercion, and coercion only works through power, through the pool of political power groups or the barrel of a gun, as Mao would say. Redistributive policy cannot coexist with peace, even in a democratic society. This is continuously illustrated every two years in America, as Spangler notes, through every modern election, which is a civil war carried on at the ballot box. In the end, it creates civil strife through forced equality in the economic sphere. It's a Ponzi scheme that pays off its old victims by creating new ones. And the justice system itself has crystallized these policies into law. As Fre Frederick Bastier foretold prophetically, the law is converted into an instrument of plunder. And what has been birthed is what Hilaire Belloc called the servile state. It's through the misapprehension of the nature of evil that man has latched on to the Enlightenment principles that believes that policies set by the state can create the conditions for good outcomes in man. But this places power in the hands of evil men who then wield their positions over others. The opposite of this, the libertarian mentality, seeks to place the power into the hands of the individual rather than the state. And this is equally flawed, because the power remains in the hands of man, and man's heart is ultimately evil, as the prophet Jeremiah tells us. And this is the heir of both ideologies. The, the blame for all social malfunctions can be attributed to none other than man himself, who is energized by an, an evil spirit that rules the world to this very day. Modern capitalism, it, it's disassociated from its founder, Adam Smith's Judeo-Christian moral foundation, that the invisible hand, he believed, would keep economic activity in check. These libertarians are unable to sync uh, themselves with the moral terms that Adam Smith put forth. As Schlossberg propounds, he says, philosophies that preach stones into bread are preaching sin without tears. 
and the ideology that takes the invisible hand to mean a preordained guarantee that goodwill results from every freely undertaken action, no matter how evil or senseless or folly. Neither the messianic state nor autonomous man can escape the consequences of evil. It runs contrary to the idolatries of mammon to believe that it is better to give than to receive. For with mammon, it is better to receive than to give. And the principle of redistribution and inflation proves this. Yet, this is the opposite of God's intent in loving your neighbor as yourself. By living according to these economic principles put forth by mammon, there is an elevation of vice over virtue. And those who are the greatest proponents of these vices, such as greed and envy, call evil good and good evil. These are the elite of society, who are the main targets of the prophets in the Old Testament's words and warnings. They're the kings, the princes, the elders, the priests of old. They are the worst in society because they are the most dangerous. This is simply due to the fact that they are considered to be the respectable representatives of Yahweh, when in reality they are a brood of vipers. These snakes simply imitate the creation of value out of nothing, fiat. But once again, this imitative process is simply idolatrous, for only God is the one who can redistribute wealth with justice. Yahweh, through Jesus Christ, is the judge and the great equalizer. Economic systems cannot satisfy the inherent lack within man's own self. Neither capitalism nor socialism wipe away man's tears. And it is the Christian's position from the beginning that only reconciliation to God through Jesus Christ can satiate man's needs. Christians find, economically speaking, that Contentment is the antithesis to mammon. In Hebrews 13.5, it says to keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Karl Marx hated Christianity because it is this very principle of contentment that neuters the revolution that perpetually runs on envy. In the end, we reap what we sow. By thinking ourselves to be the masters of our wealth and material goods, we have become slaves to them rather than stewards, which is our proper relationship to creation. And in this enslavement, we serve the god of materialism, Mammon, who is the same god whom the ancient kingdoms of Israel and Judah served, thinking they were serving Yahweh but only with lip service, not indeed originating from the heart. And how could they? The only prescription for these economic desolations of greed and idolatry is repentance and faith towards God. The remedy is the same today as it ever was. Unless we turn from our evil deeds of insatiable greed, we will be consumed by them and we will go to the grave starving for more, begging like the leech's daughter who cries, More, more.